Okay, so this is the part where we put the live and live events, right? Um, you guys will be seeing a little demo, you can probably guess of what, in a little, in a little while. Um, but first, just to give a bit of context, so um, Helen is not only the founder and CEO of Sci-Fi Works, but she also co-founded a company called iRobot 25 years ago. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have or have ever owned a Roomba? All right, and how many of you have a drone? Well, you could probably sell a few more today. Um, give, us a, give us a little bit of context of what we're going to be seeing now. Well, um, we're going to see the level one drone. It's a drone that we just kick-started, and we raised over three times the amount of money we were looking for. And, like uh, 900,000, right? Close yeah, to Yeah, close to that. And, um, it's a very um, special drone. It's, uh, it, most of the drones, they're like flying all over the place and they're tilting into the motion. This one just flies level because of some aerodynamic uh, advancements that we've made. It's also a very social drone. It connects right to the internet and it sends pictures uh, uh, right out uh, streaming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would you like to see it? Yes, absolutely. So, uh... It's gonna be a little loud. Yeah. So we'll just uh, let you see the drone. We're gonna go overhead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We managed to avoid an Enrique Iglesias moment, so um, that went well. Better than Enrique and like Iglesias. Yeah, much better, much better. Nobody was harmed in, in that demo. So how much does this, is this selling already? And, and how uh, much? No, we did a Kickstarter, and now we're concentrating on the development. We kickstarted it because it wasn't fully developed yet. Um, we have a demo unit, uh, but there's more things we have to do to take it to production in the Far East. We have it. Uh, we have information about when it goes into pre-sales on our website, so we'd appreciate it if you go there at uh, sci-fi work slash LVL1 and sign up for our pre-sale information. And what's that, I mean, in, in your view, you've been in robotics for, for a very long time, but why are these so popular, not just with hobbyists, but now we're seeing a lot of con commercial interest, mm -hmm. of course. It seems to have caught a lot of people by surprise, including the FAA. Yeah. Well, that goes why I switched over to drones. I've done ground robots my entire career, and they are wonderful. Um, but you know, if you look around this room, the drone can just get almost anywhere. The ground robot would be running into your seats and running into the people, and there'd be cables on the floor. Yeah, a Roomba a demo board. isn't yeah. as interesting also if we just had one flying, uh, you know, yeah, running flying. around. <laughs> that, that not flying, yeah. yeah. A flying vacuum machine is not. Um, and then outside, the same way, right? Um, you know, on the, you know, if you get up just above the treetops, above the trees, above the cars, above the traffic, you know, there's no streams or rocks, uh, no houses, and um, you know, there's almost a lane waiting for that drone delivery, which um, you know, I believe will come uh, in the next five years. Mm. So, um, what about some of the the regulatory hurdles? Um, you know, I mentioned the FAA, and they've been working on new regulations for a while, and. President Obama has uh, asked for you know, some kind of federal laws around privacy issues. I don't think the White House appreciated the drones landing on their lawn, <laughs> apparently. They didn't appreciate um, that drone, but I was invited to the White House and I took this drone and that, that drone was and that appreciated well. by the president. Oh, yeah? yes. okay. So what do you think, I mean, what do you think should happen when it comes to both you know, what the FAA is doing and um, privacy laws around drones? Well, the FAA, previous to this year, they, um, there was no way to fly commercially. And I just want to step back um, because a lot of people will be confused because it was a drone at the bike ride and your friend or you, know, you might have a drone. It's perfectly legal to fly as a hobbyist. As long as you're not taking money for flying, it's perfectly okay. Uh, with a few restrictions, like you're not supposed to go over 400 feet and you're not supposed to be within five miles of an airport. By the way, you can't fly an Aspen by that measure. <laughs> So that, that drone might not have been okay. Are we okay with this? <laughs> Indoors, Indoors is fine. fine. All right, good. Um, <laughs> and, um, but it was absolutely no way to get to fly commercially unless you were a police department or a fire department or a public entity. This year, the FAA has, made, has um, uh, allowed exemptions to these rules, and you get what's called a 333 exemption, and then you can fly commercially. But you have to have that exemption for a specific... Um, uh, for a, a specific company, uh, you can't just get an exemption for your drone in general. Uh, so it's still a little bit hard, and in, uh, by 
late 2016, early 2017, um, they proposed rules that all commercial drones can fly under, assuming that they obey certain guidelines, like they're, um, you know, they don't go above 500 feet, and they're not, you know, going near near airports as well. So they're from not so having any way to fly. To it's moving forward now. Uh, what I think should happen is they should just hobbyists have had a really great um, uh, safe record. There's like, you know, there's probably a million of these flying in the country now. Um, they should just let and only commercial applications. Got decapitated, and only Enrique Iglesias got his fingers. And he was probably so. indoors, so yeah. that doesn't even count. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think they should just let commercial applications fly under the same kind of rules that hobbyists have been flying, and then maybe later on get uh, non line of sight applications because. Um, when you're talking about delivering a package from a fulfillment center or a store to a house that's actually flying a large mass over a populated area. And I think um, we need to do a little more work before we just open that up. But I think opening up applications like uh, for real estate, for getting great pictures of buildings, for uh, claims adjustment, um, for people taking videos and putting them, you know, and selling them, you know, a drone like this is not going to create any problems with the airspace. But, but what about privacy? You didn't really touch on the privacy issues there, and there are a lot of, I, you know, I would think legitimate, some of them legitimate concerns um, about the data that's collected and what's done with that data. So what do you think the, the regulations should be around privacy? Well, I, should I think talking any? about the drones and privacy is a little bit of a red herring. Um, the, uh, you know, the actual issue is cameras and where they should be pointed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it shouldn't matter whether, you know, you have a camera on, on a stick, uh, you know, with a telephoto lens from one building to another. Uh, it's not really a question of the drone, because, you, you know, you can get pictures from a man flight and that would be legal. It really should, we should take on privacy. And I want to be private in my own, your, you know, house, backyard, as much as the next person, but we should take on where people should be allowed to point cameras and not specifically for the drones, because it's just another camera. And the cameras, you know, they're in satellites, they're in your cell phone, mm -hmm. they're, um, you know, uh, on people's helmets, that you know they're all over the place. <laughs> and are you, um, you? You mentioned going to the White House and flying this around. Are you advising in any capacity on some of these regulations that are coming up? Um, and ask for I, your I, opinion. I, I was at the White House as an uh, ambassador for global entrepreneurship, trying to encourage uh, entrepreneurship around the world, which is part of the administration and the Commerce Secretary's uh, agenda. Um, because it's one of the best exports that we have of this uh, country. Uh, I have been uh, involved in talking to people about regulations, and I, I hope um, you know, this is putting our country backwards, having so many restrictions on flight and having such a long process to go through that it would be great if either Congress or the administration could jump in and open it up sooner, because everyone knows the way it's going, so um, we'd just like to get there quicker. <laughs> So what are some of the, the other applications that we haven't seen yet? I mean, I, I know I've read about companies like, obviously, Facebook, uh, you know, investing in some of the, some drone technology, and Disney filing for, for drone <laughs> patents. What have we not seen yet for, as far as commercial goes, you know, commercial uses go? Oh, wow, there were, so, there were just so many, anything from mining to agriculture to construction to security, um, entertainment, as you mentioned. Um, you know, there's almost not a, fi a physical company that's not looking at their drone strategy right now. So it's really great for me as an entrepreneur because when I was trying to get people interested for iRobot, I had to go kick down doors and say, robots, robots, robots. And now people come to us and say, you know, can you get us drones for this application? And, and speaking of iRobot, so you co-founded the company just out of MIT, started as an MIT project, mm -hmm. right? Um, back in 1990, and fast forward to 2008 when you were launching Sci-Fi Works. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about just the difference in how you were received, how fundraising went for you, um, just how different the whole robotics field is oh. today versus then? Well, it's a completely different environment for startups in general. In 1990, there weren't the kind of entrepreneurship classes and um, contests and mentorship at, at university. So we basically, we just were out on our own. Today, I'm glad to say that a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the kids, the students, are getting um, more mentorship. And they have a lot of role models to, to look at and say, hey, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pretty different environment. And I had trouble, believe it or not, raising money uh, for Roomba because it was a consumer product. And the venture capitalists were 
oh, uh, consumer products are so finick, you know, um, uh, fickle and uh, vacuuming. Who does that anymore? Because I guess the venture capitalists don't actually vacuum their houses. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if we, we actually raise money for industrial uses um, and military uses for the iRobot platforms, which we have many of. Um, but, you know, Roomba was a runaway success. Mm -hmm. And, and fundraising for Sci-Fi Works, how has that gone for you? Obviously, you have a track record now, but you've, you've raised um, 13.5 mm -hmm. million to date, not including the Kickstarter yeah. campaign, of course. Um, what was that process like for you, going to, to investors Well, today? I, I can tell you, I wasn't looking for money when um, so they came those investors you. came in, and uh -huh. they, they came to me. I think it's just a great time for entrepreneurs and for new ideas. And um, in the, you know, the drone space, it's really, there's a lot of momentum behind it. There's a lot of people adopting drones. You know, people might have seen, you know, their friends have a drone, or they might even try to drone themselves. And they see that this is just the tip of the iceberg in where drones can go, because these are autonomous robots. and um, uh, you know, the first l level, you're, you're just flying them around and taking pictures, but, you know, this robot, as we deliver it, it will already automatically follow you. Um, it has geofencing technology, so it will automatically stay in an area. You'll be able to download geofences from no-fly zones that other people have set up, like mm. the FAA or around airports. And, you know, there's so many uh, spaces we can go with it, so I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, this drone is following uh, my, my, my daughter and playing games with her, maybe taking her a lunch if she forgot it, uh, you know, going up and uh, uh, keeping an eye on the property that's, you know, looking at your house if, uh, if a storm blows through. Just so many applications for these. Uh, you know, I think they're more like appliances. They're more like the next generation of video camera. Uh -huh. Because who buys a video camera nowadays, right? You use your cell phone. But this is like a video camera that you can get a bird's eye view, but you also can do those rolling shots and you know, sweeping shots and uh, things that you couldn't really do with a handheld video camera. So we'll, we'll open to questions in just a few minutes um, in case any of you want to ask Helen anything. But um, what are the, the most promising um, sectors here? I mean, your investors, what were they most interested in? Um, and, and what are you looking at the most? Uh, is it the, the hobbyist? Is that the biggest sort of a, you know, revenue stream? Or is it the commercial government use? Oh, we, we see all three going really strong right now. We're on a deployment path with the military for force protecting, protection, keeping our soldiers safer. If you have one of these drones up all the time, we build uh, these systems on tethers so they're always being powered and they, um, you know, they can stay up indefinitely. We call it persistent flight. Um, we're taking that, those um, technologies to commercial applications because companies, after trying a few of these drones, have figured out they don't want to pay someone to always be flying the drone, bring it back, flying it again, when our drones can be persistent. And then, um, you know, we look at this as not just a consumer drone, but a light industrial drone. Um, it'll take on those applications where, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not hardened for, you know, out in the pouring rain or, or snow like our other robots and not environmentally sealed, but it's for those applications where you can choose when you're flying, like claims adjustment, real estate, um, inventory uh, at, at stores, just so many uh, applications. And when you were starting out um, at MIT and, and starting this company, um, and you're still, you've been involved with MIT over the years, um, including on the Board of Trustees, were there a lot of uh, women interested in robotics then, and are there more or less now? Hmm. You have two male co-founders, I should say, or yep. you had two male yep. co-founders at iRobot. Um, well, just as I was getting into this at the Artificial Intelligence Lab, lab now CSAIL at MIT, there were quite a few women grad students. Uh, Cynthia uh, Brazil is one. She's doing the GBO uh, social robot, and Maya Matoric, who's a well-known professor at uh, uh, USC. So there, there was a, I, I think, women were inspired, potentially like me, from seeing the Star Wars movies mm -hmm. that, uh, Your inspiration you know, was R2-D2, right? My inspiration was R2-D2. Seeing that these devices can be a very creative expression, seeing that they have a personality, an agenda, um, the ca kind of a character, and really more than machines. And I think that got a lot of women, as well as men, interested in trying to actually make them real. Mm -hmm. Do you think that today there are, I mean, are you seeing, especially in the Boston area where a lot of this is coming out of, are you seeing increased interest in general um, from entrepreneurs yeah. who want to start robotics companies? Oh, there's definitely a lot of interest in robotics companies. There's, um, you know, there's hundreds in the Boston area alone, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, iRobot was a, 
uh, you know, a proof of uh, success um, where investors could actually get a great run, return on investment, and uh, that's actually helped ease the wheels for the next generation of robotic entrepreneurs. Okay. Questions from the audience? Just raise your hand if anybody wants to ask something. I think we have a question way over there. Of course, the MIT guy. The, the technology, you know, we have 3D printing, the, the portfolio of technologies that can go into drones and robotics in 2015 is very, very different from what it was in 1995. What do you think is going to be the most important technological shift, computational or materials or whatever, in the next five years of the evolution of robotics or drones? Oh, uh, so right, right now it's the ability to get processes that have amazing functionality uh, for a price point you can put in a consumer product, a lot more than is on a Roomba, you know, when you have visual processing and, and the likes. Uh, in the next five years, I think um, more, more different types of uh, sensors um, that are automatically processing the data, um, you know. Yeah, there's going to be sense and avoid on, on these uh, robots. Um, better ability to do indoor flight, um, you know, and it's really, we, we are absolutely, with no apologies, leveraging from the cell phone industry and the advances they, they're making in, uh, you know, whether it's processors or uh, Wi-Fi or GPS or uh, IMUs or um, even doing three-dimensional sensing, the next generation of cell phones will have three-dimensional sensing in, so you can tell you know, about objects and about spaces. We put that same technology into the drones. So you look at their roadmaps and map it onto what's going on? Uh, yes, because um, robots are doing quite well, but there's a lot of money going into the cell phone industry. Is, is Roomba, by the way, still the, the, the highest-selling commercial robot? as far as I know, for a commercial mobile system. Yeah. I, I discount the uh, manufacturing robots. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Helen, I was curious. You said you, you moved from ground and air was, was the next place to go. I'm curious, was there another place you were thinking? And, and obviously, I know you're very busy with your current company. But is there something in your mind that think there's another type of robot, another generation of robot that at some point I want to get into? We have, we have. Oh, yeah, that's a really good robots, question. Right? <laughs> I'm robot just so focused on the drones right now. I just see so many capabilities that we're really at the tip of the iceberg. You know, they, they really are like computer systems. You can expand their functionality by adding more sensors and more, uh, m more intelligent software. So I've really been concentrating on that right now. Question over here. Hi, Brian O'Keefe from Fortune. So drones have kind of a ominous connotation R2-D2, the droid, was very friendly. The Roomba is kind of friendly. But if you're talking about a, a flying drone following your daughter around, <laughs> what can you do design-wise to make that feel less ominous and oh, more oh, friendly? Oh. My Look drone. how cute it My is. Drone. But that sound is very, not Very, very so friendly. <laughs> uh, yeah, the acoustics in here. Your, your five-month-old isn't scared when this follows her around. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> she's, she's five months old. So she doesn't. She doesn't get, walk around too much yet. Right. But, you know, out, outdoors, <laughs> the usage pattern is you, you know, you're up away from you taking pictures of either you or some other thing of interest. The sound, once you get a little ways away, it's, it's really not, you know, in, in, intrusive. Uh, and it's all about the, the, the loading. As the systems get lighter, they, um, you know, they'll, th th they'll be able to get more and more. So as battery technology gets better and better, we've seen a few advances on, on the horizon will be able to make them uh, less and less uh, noisy. But I, I don't think, you know, I, I, I explain it the way, when I, when I was running iRobot, the, uh, you know, people would say, oh, robots like the dog, and they meant the Sony iBo. <laughs> and words change meanings, and I think people are as likely to think of these kind of drones now as, the, you know, uh, the military robots, and soon they'll be able, you know, they'll think of the uh, package delivery drones. And when you start talking to people about applications like that, they start thinking, it, yeah, I want that. I want my packages in 30 minutes. And uh, then they stop thinking of it as an ominous technology and a useful technology. Are you less scared now? He's still on the fence. <laughs> Is there a question over there? Hi. Can you announce yourself, by the way? 
say your sure. name? Sure, I'm, I'm Jordan Urbach from Ocho. Hi. Uh, so, so we've got drones that are capable of carrying large packages fairly efficiently. We've got anti-collision and collision recovery software on board on most drones. What in your mind is the number one thing that is keeping Amazon from delivering <laughs> a pizza to me in New York City today? <laughs> well, most drones don't have sense and avoid technology on them yet. The next generation of these drones will, but that's uh, a year or two out. Um, in, in New York City, it's Pretty bad location. Uh, it's got a, a GPS um, shadow in mo most of the city, and most of these drones are, um, are uh, using um, GPS to uh, bound the drift on the IMU inside. Um, but the technology that you know we're flying on this, um, uh, you know, with the camera looking down, that's another way to do it. So as those types of technologies gets better and better, and you're using auxiliary methods to know where you are, that's when you'll get your pizza delivered in New York City. Question over here. Can you say your name, please? Yes. Navrina Singh Qualcomm. So nice to see you again, Helen. Nice to see you. So, um, you know, it's interesting you didn't mention the flight times. So traditionally, right now, we are looking at about 20 minutes. But I was wondering, like, as the flight times, as there are disruptions in mm -hmm. drone space, and the flight times are about two hours, four hours long, what kind of use cases do you anticipate we'll be uncovering? Oh, well, some of our, um, our, our industrial robots already have um, uh, infinite time of flight. Um, we send them up for days at a time, but they're on a tether connected to the ground, so they're being powered from the ground. So some people say we're cheating. I say we're smart, because what matters to our customers is that they have a persistent view of their entire facility. Um, we use that same technology to go into buildings uh, with a spooler on our pocket flyer robot, and that allows you um, it's not just time of flight, but you lose your um, communications link when you go into a building and around a few corners, and you don't have too much power to be able to supply, uh, you know, for extended um, uh, radios on these uh, these the, these things. So um, it really is a. Uh, um, Batteries are getting better, and you know this one we're advertising 20 minutes. We think we're going to be able to do a little better on it uh, because of some clever uh, engineering. But I, I've just been reading about some new battery technologies. For example, from uh, the guy who founded A123 has another company. We're hoping those pan out, uh, you know, because as I said, we're not only leeching off the cell phone industry. We want to um, use any of these technologies that are developing for mobile applications. Um, I think I, we actually, I'll ask just one quick last question um, because people oh, probably want to know. Are, what's that? Those guys oh. are shaking their hands up and down over there. If it's a burning question, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Gary Lauder of Lauder Partners. Um, my question is, uh, assuming that br drones become pervasive, are there any emerging any requirements regarding transponders and identification? Because if, for example, a drone were flying over my home and I didn't know whose it was, I'd want to have a wa have a way to know whose it was. So if there were an RF transponder, an IR transponder, requirements for markings and minimum font sizes, mm -hmm. and I, I've, I've received business plans for uh, companies creating drone detectors, for example, <laughs> for prisons, uh, smuggling in weapons and so forth. So I mean, there's going to be a need to identify them, especially if they're pervasive, and I'm wondering if those uh, standards are being defined yet. Okay, well, I don't, think, answer, I don't way. think you have to assume they'll be pervasive. They will be. There's a technology called ADSB that the FAA is going to require or more man, all manned aircrafts by 2020. That'll be on the drones. And it won't give you that precision of um, location, but you'll know within you know 50 feet or so, and we can just stay away from each other. This is very small drones, very, very big airspace. <laughs> so, and just quick yes or no question. Um, you took iRobot public in 2005. You yeah. were instrumental in that. Is this company going to go public also? Do you oh, see that happening? Um, it's, it's a little premature to answer that uh, question, but I think there will be uh, several multi-billion dollar companies in the drone space because the area is that large. All right. Well, thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. And I'll, you can exit this.